We've discussed transistors quite a bit on this channel, from general framework to how they send and receive data, how that works with your operating system and other components in the PC, and that's all basically the framework for today's video. So is the modern transistor on its way out the door? Are you tired of getting those copyright claims in your YouTube videos for using content that maybe you shouldn't because it's not really yours, video content that you didn't produce but that you want to use in your videos? That's exactly what Videoblocks offers and it's all royalty free which means no copyright strikes at all. Videoblocks has over 3 million videos and after effects you can implement into your videos to make them look as professional as possible. Check this out, you even get a 7 day free trial via the link below. You got nothing to lose, right? It's free. So check it out, click the link below and get started with their huge library of video resources. Let's define Moore's Law first, which isn't actually a natural law in any sense, it's more or less an observation. It also relates to the fabrication process and how quickly things are shrinking down to that threshold size at which point transistors will no longer work the way they were intended. In 1965, Gordon Moore was asked to predict trends in the semiconductor industry over the next decade. This is 1965, by the way, when modern computers weren't even really being thought of yet. In his article, Moore wrote, the complexity for minimum component costs has increased at a rate of roughly a factor of two per year. Certainly, over the short term, this rate can be expected to continue, if not increase. Over the long term, the rate of increase is a bit more uncertain, although there is no reason to believe that it will not remain nearly constant for at least 10 years. Moore was right. Among flash memory manufacturers in particular, fabrication processes were doubling in complexity every one and a half to two years. It's actually been increasing recently. As for central processors, namely Intel and AMD, things are a bit slower, but still trending. Just look at the last decade. In 2006, the Intel Core 2 Duo boasted a 65 nanometer process. Five years later, with the release of Sandy Bridge, the process had shrunk to 32 nanometers, allowing for insane transistor counts per die. Just three years later, we were on the 22 nanometer process, and today we have Sky, KB, and Coffee Lake chips, along with AMD's Ryzen CPUs, all boasting the modern 14 nanometer process. This length, by the way, describes the degree of accuracy within a transistor. No distance in particular, though you'll hear the distance between the source and drain being mentioned quite a bit, which is considerably smaller than said process. Here's a clip from one of my previous Minute Science videos clarifying the nomenclature. Once upon a time, this length actually meant something, typically the length of the transistor gate. But as senior fellow and technology and manufacturing group director of Intel, Mark Bohr proclaims, he currently, quote, can't point to the one dimension that's 32 or 22 or 14 nanometers on any of these processors. Quote, some dimensions are smaller than the stated node name and others are larger. In short, by today's standards, these lengths are more like milestone indicators for companies. An example of this would be Global Foundry's 14 nanometer chips. Subramani Kanjeri, Vice President of Advanced Technology Architecture at Global Foundries, revealed that his first generation 14 nanometer FinFET chips essentially recycled old 20 nanometer framework and simply, quote, plugged in FinFET, making this new technology, quote, 20 nanometer FinFET in a way, end quote meaning that the company simply reduced the lithographic numeral for the sake of signifying the change from a planner to fin design. Misleading? Yes, although most consumers are unlikely to notice, except for all of you watching this video. Many have postulated that the distance between the source and drain of any modern transistor will eventually become so small that current, the electrons in particular, will simply jump the bridge between the two electrodes without actually needing a physical connection. This is a process known as quantum tunneling, and it's pretty much inevitable unless we do something to mitigate that transition from one electrode to the other. If you can't open and close a transistor at will, then the transistor is virtually useless. Leaks already happen to some degree due to imperfections in the fabrication processes, which is why some cores are disabled in AMD and Intel CPUs. It's inevitable, nothing we make is perfect, but if every transistor in a chip experienced this to a large degree thanks to a shrunken process, the CPU wouldn't be reliable. It would constantly hang and create errors. So when is too small? At one point we believed just 5 nanometers, that is until IBM just this year released a full 
fully functioning chip based on the 5 nanometer process. In fact, in the general consumer space, we're not far from that. Intel's releasing Canon Lake here soon based on the 10 nanometer process, and flash memory is already on its way. Since the early 2000s, in fact, we've been tickling this boundary. Transistors as small as 3 nanometers were being developed in Korea by 2006. In 2012, they did it again with a 2 nanometer transistor. The same year, a single atom even was used as a transistor. So this does not mean in any way, shape, or form that the modern transistor is on its way out, soon to be replaced by quantum computers. In fact, most of what you do day to day will benefit more from the transistor that we have today, a simple open and closed transistor versus a quantum computer. They're just so much more complicated, extremely costly, and I'd say that even if we were on a level playing field here and they cost the same, in some instances there would still be a case made for the simple binary transistor over a super complex computer like that of a quantum one. Streaming Netflix or watching YouTube videos won't benefit from a quantum computer at all. Instead, various processes will be implemented to ensure that current doesn't leak unexpectedly between the source and drain of those modern binary transistors. Extending barriers, the use of carbon nanotubes, and silicon photonics are all proposed technologies intended to mitigate the effects of quantum mechanics. We may have slowed down a bit since the golden age of Mr. Moore, but that does not mean in any sense that his law, which is actually an observation, defines the end of the modern transistor. It simply talks about how quickly we've been advancing towards the zero nanometer process, toward the point where we can't get any smaller. The width of an atom, maybe the width of a cork, if you want to get really technical with it, that's all later on down the line, but I have no doubt that we'll get there eventually. As for now, the modern transistor will remain modern. I don't expect that we'll be replacing them with quantum computers anytime soon. They're just too costly, and honestly, what we do in most day-to-day -day tasks won't benefit from quantum computers anyway. Stay tuned for what's coming next after the 10 nanometer process should be pretty exciting from both a power and performance standpoint. Again, we'd like to thank Videoblocks for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to click the link in the video description. It's at the very top there. It's your seven day free trial. It's just, it's just there waiting for you. Free. You guys check it out. Let me know what you think about it, by the way, in the comment section below once you have signed up. If you like this video, be sure to give this one a thumbs up. I do appreciate it. Also click that red subscribe button for more content like this and the bell notification icon to receive the notifications that videos like this have been posted on the channel. That goes a long way for us and not many people are being notified about these videos these days. This is Science Studio. Thanks for learning with us.